That's where he is. That's where he practices yeah. his odd brand of medicine, if That's you will. Right. Christian, you see this poster. It literally just came out. What was your take? Uh, it's great. I love it. I mean, you know... For, for, I think for people, the unknown, that's exactly what it is. It's the unknown for us. It's the unknown for Dr. Strange in general. It's a nice way. It's not that just a face, you know, just like a big face in the middle of it. It's something completely different. You see the back of the cape. It's everything I wanted. I like that. Okay, but look, and I, I think the poster is awesome, too, because I've been aware for a while that a Dr. Strange movie is coming out. Do you guys think that this poster either needs to or does the job enough to sell people who aren't aware that there's a Dr. Strange movie who have a working understanding of Captain America and Iron Man and those kind of heroes, but they might have no idea what this movie is. Does this do enough to intrigue a more rudimentary viewer? I think it's a nice what's that poster. I think it's a perfect thing for someone because it's got the Marvel logo on the bottom, mm -hmm. and if someone doesn't know what Doctor Strange is, they go, oh, I wonder what, well, it's a guy with a cape, Marvel movie, okay, curious what it is. Oh, that's Doctor Strange. You're with right. your buddy who knows Doctor Strange and starts telling you about it, or you look it up and you see what's coming out on 11 4 16. Oh, Doctor Strange, Benedict Cumberbatch. Sounds interesting. It's, it's a good way to tease it, and then we're getting the trailer tonight so yeah I, I, I like your different voices for the, the ah, people walking ah, ah, i like the i like the that that symbol uh, not only is it just his window but it's also very uh, like mystical looking you yeah know? it's a it's a cool symbol i mean so. if i was looking out that window i'd be a little intimidated and i might make that noise ah, ah. <laughs> Just a quick one. <laughs> now we will actually get into the rundown where we have a bunch of exciting news from the world of movies to talk about. Ashley, what is up first? Early word out of the critics and industry screening of Captain America Civil War says that there's a lot to get excited about in the movie, especially with the debut of Chadwick Boseman's T'Challa, a.k.a. Black Panther. Though fans will finally get to meet Boseman's Black Panther when Civil War hits theaters next month, his solo film is now gearing up production with Creed's Ryan Coogler set to direct. While speaking to Kevin Feige for Captain America's Civil War, Collider.com's own Haley Fouch asked about the status of the Black Panther script, with Feige responding that not only is Coogler directing, he is also co-writing as he did with his other projects Creed and Fruitvale Station. On the process of starting production, Feige said, very soon. We have a number of writers on it, including Ryan Coogler, who is also directing. He's working on the draft right now. Between now and the end of summer, there will be more casting announcements. We start filming at the very beginning of next year. Mark, are you excited to hear that Ryan Coogler is also co-writing Black Panther? Ashley, I am over the proverbial moon about this because Ryan Coogler, you mentioned it when you were talking about what movies he's already done that he directed, that he also co-wrote Fruitvale Station, which proved he can do a great story, and Creed, which proved that he can come to an already existing franchise that has a lot of love, a lot of passion, and inject freshness into it, but also not take away the nostalgia that we want. This guy is the perfect choice to direct Black Panther, and I just love the way that Marvel makes their movies because it is such a collaborative effort that, okay, so the guy directing it is going to have a say in what happens in the writer's room. There's also other pretty smart people in there that are going to be giving him ideas. It's such a nice collective unit, or at least that's the way it sounds. And quick story time with Uncle Mark is that I got to meet Ryan Coogler at the Star Wars The Force Awakens premiere. I was walking on the red carpet, probably annoying George Lucas, and I see Christian talking to this dude, and I walk over, and Christian's like, oh, Mark, you should meet Ryan Coogler. And we both gushed, and we were all talking about how excited we were about Star Wars. And the only reason I tell that story is because this guy is is a fan of movies. He loves properties like this. So the fact that he's taking this over and now co-writing it makes a lot of sense to me. Christian? I think it's absolutely 100% agree with you. And I had the pleasure of first interviewing him during the Creed Junket and mm -hmm. hearing his passion of w the way that he got Creed made. It was all because of him. He got that movie made, stolen, passed on, and it was his passion from Fruitvale Station leading into his passion for Creed that got that movie made. And then I'm sure that he had the same amount of passion for Black Panther. And it's funny, you mentioned the st uh, Star Wars when I was talking to him um, for like 10 minutes on the red carpet. We were, I, I was like, hey, you know, you, now you got Black Panther, and it hadn't been confirmed yet. So it was like, well, that that's that's that hasn't been confirmed yet because he didn't want to give it away. I'm sure at the time it actually they were ready to go with it. But he is a guy that is going to bring so much. And now, and this is not we're not going to spoil anything. We really can't talk about the Please review God, with, with Civil War. But I will say that Black Panther is handled in in a really in a great way. That that I will say it handled in a great way. And knowing that I am already invested with that character, I will get even more invested with the character, knowing that this guy is co-writing and directing the film. Schnepp, you can also weigh in on this story if you promise to be non-spoiler. I promise to be non-spoiler. Thank you. Your take. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Mark Ellis did not see Captain America Civil War, so yeah. both Christian and I, who did 
get a chance to see yeah. that amazing film. We we can't talk about it at all. We even can't talk about what? A, well, we can't talk about what? Captain America: Civil War. Did we see Civil War? We, oh, we saw and, it. And you know what? Black Panther is introduced in that he in is. that movie. And let me just That's say, the Captain America: Tony it, Stark movie. It's an incredible introduction to a fantastic character that for years I've been waiting to see on the silver screen. And man, Boseman just kills it. Yeah, he nails it as Black Panther, as T'Challa. Um, so the Russo brothers do a great introduction. So I'm really, uh, I'm really excited to see what Coogler does to further the story. So with no spoilers, there you go. And as a director, I mean, you like the fact that this guy's also co-writing this, that he gets to be it. in the room talking about this story. I think it's it's so important. I I, I know the Russos work really really closely with uh, uh, I think Marcus and McFeely, yeah. the other guys' yep. names. Um, and they, you know, it's a collaborative effort. And with any movie, it's a collaborative effort. So it's, I think it's great that he's actually, you know, sitting there and putting in the hard work to make sure that the that they make a great, great film. Absolutely. How about your guys take out there? Comment on the YouTube video and in the chat room right now. Let us know what do you think of the Doctor Strange poster, this new Black Panther news, and our next story, which involves animals. John Favreau's The Jungle Book doesn't hit theaters until this weekend, and already there is a sequel in development. According to THR, Disney is in talks with director John Favreau and screenwriter Justin Marks to return for The Jungle Book 2. Their plan is to utilize the various stories written by Rudyard Kipling to adapt into the next chapter. No word yet if any of the A-list voice talent will be returning for the sequel, but sources say that most likely everyone will be back if the story calls for it. Disney's live action The Jungle Book hits theaters this Friday. Schnepp, thoughts on A Jungle Book 2 happening? Well, it's shocking. The movie hasn't even come out yet. But, you know, the movie's really fun. It's got a lot of cool animals that aren't real, that you honestly think are real. They're hopping around, talking, scuttling, doing weird things. Uh, that's one of the things that I liked, I loved about the movie was just watching all the other animals. Even while some of the characters are talking, you're just watching like a, a weird rodent skittle around. And, like you know, it's just really crazy, the detail. So I think the making a Jungle Book 2, they've got all those creatures already built. Now they just have a need to a story. Rudyard Kipling's got a ton of different stories. I'm I'm just wondering, are they also going to have a new musical numbers? You know, but uh, I, I'm all for it. I love the Jungle Book, so why not get a Jungle Book too? Kristen, you love animal scuttling. What about this news? I am gonna buy it. Well, we're not buying yet, but you oh, can go ahead well, and purchase it. I'll buy it anyway <laughs> because this is what <laughs> I feel like doing right now. Um, <laughs> what do I think about the news? I think that it's it's. I love the movie. And I think that I, I'm excited to hear a sequel being announced if Favreau is indeed very excited about it. I don't want it to be an Iron Man 2 situation where he has to do it and it's just like, go, go, go. I want it to be something to where he is going to be passionate about it, that they take the Kipling stories and they, and they evolve it with the Disney flair. But what I'm nervous about is that what I love so much about this movie was that it took a lot of the animated movie that I loved and it added mythology to it, but right. it, if you watch that movie, it stayed very true. The first thing I didn't like about Maleficent is it just said, oh, that has a character named Maleficent, but it was nothing like the, the, the Sleeping Beauty story. Right. That's where Cinderella, they stayed to the story, and it did say, so a Jungle Book. Now, there's no more movie to tell, so it's not to say that Kipling, like again, he had a bunch of stories, but we don't know how that would have been evolved into an animated movie. And like you said, will there be songs in it? Will, uh, what, is it going to continue with Baloo and, and Bagheera and all those? So... Um, if Favreau is excited about it and put and Justin Marks writes the script and they get and they can get on board with that same kind of magic that was put into this one, of course I'm gonna want to see it. It just makes me a little nervous knowing that there was nothing before it. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of working pieces to this right now, and these are all talks that they're having right now. So they're gauging Favreau's interest, and it seems like he's jacked about it. What concerns me about that is that John Favreau, look, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fault him totally for Iron Man two because he made a great movie and then he came back and they were trying to expand the Marvel universe and it. It seemed like there was a confluence of ideas that didn't all work out in that film. As a director, you're partially responsible for that. As long as it can be, like Christian said, a singular vision of what you want to do. But at the same time, Favreau has a lot of things that he seems to be involved in. Maybe he wants to go do a Star Wars story. Maybe he wants to work on that Magic Kingdom movie, which is going to take a lot of the same effects and technologies that they pioneered with the Jungle Book. So when do you get to do a movie like this? When do you get to come back to this? Or do you take another director? I'm not saying there isn't another director out there that can make a great sequel to Jungle Book, but the other thing to consider is that Jungle Book Origins, which is the Andy Serkis vision of the Jungle Book, which is probably going to be darker, more adult in tone, is scheduled to come out now in 2018. They bumped it back a year, probably in large part because of all the fan fervor and the fan love, the critical praise for this Jungle Book. And now, apparently, to reports that were that are circulating on the web this morning, is that maybe they're going to scrap that project entirely 
in large part because the Jungle Book 2 might be such a huge force. What do you think about that news? I hate the fact that, look, I, I love Andy Serkis. I, make, uh, I don't try to hide it. He's one of my favorite actors out there working today. I think he's one of the most talented dudes out there. and He's a really good director as well. And I was excited to hear that his Jungle Book movie was coming. I thought it was a good move to push it because this movie th th that's coming out this weekend is going to do really well with audiences. It's going to do well with box office. So I was like, okay, push it back and let people forget about this one. And in two years, you know, come out with yours. Now that they're going to do a sequel and it's probably going to land around the same time as this one, I hate to say it, but it, I think it's time for Andy Serkis to move on to something else. It's mm -hmm. just like get past the Jungle Book. It's like this is going to be the one that's it, they got there first. And yeah. I hate to say it, but I just I think Andy Serkis should do something else and not do Jungle Book. Well, that's the thing. It's like it's not like Andy Serkis is a one trick pony. You know, no, the, the guy can do everything from Kong to Gollum to Snoke and anything else that he dreams of. And now he has all this power to be able to direct a movie that's going to have a lot of performance capture in it. I would love to see his vision of Jungle Book. So I'm not saying I don't want to see that anymore, but but it might be interesting for him to move on to something else because this Jungle Book schnapp is going to crush in theaters and I think people are going to have a big appetite for a sequel to that. I don't think John Favreau is going to direct Jungle Book 2. I think he's going to move on and he's just going to produce it okay. because he basically helped build the architecture and all the characters and the character movements and how they act by directing. So it feels like it's if if anything would be an easy handoff, mm -hmm. it would be the Jungle Book 2. I mean, why not hand it off to Andy Circus? I mean, I, I, that's well, a, one, well, he's probably that's got a, very he's, interesting. He's probably got a yeah. contract with Warner yeah, Brothers, though. I, yeah, honestly, it's really it's painful to hear that that they are doing a Jungle Book two, and it's going to come out at the same time as another Jungle Book yeah. movie that's not a, a successful. We're all guessing that the Jungle Book is going to be a big hit. Um, you know how how much time it takes to put into you know they probably did tons of previs. I'm sure Andy Serkis already has the entire animatic done for the film. That's months, maybe years of work that yeah. he's already done. So when something like this happens, it's crushing. So it's not like he's just going to get up tomorrow and be like, I'm going to do another movie. Yeah. So you know it's going to probably take some time to figure that out. Plus he's also acting in a bunch of other things. So you know when you have your schedule all set up and you're like, well, I'll definitely be doing this for this six months. Then I jump off and do this. You can't just be like, all right, I'll do another movie because you've already got like th your next three or four years lined up. Plus so, he's doing apes and everything too. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's kind of crushing. So yeah. you know, I, it, with with the Jungle Book being so much fun and successful, probably very successful this weekend, it's also bittersweet hearing about this and them already pre-announcing a Jungle Book 2, which will probably put the kibosh on Jungle Book Origins or whatever the thing was he was doing. Right. That's right. Well, look, the movie comes out this weekend. We can't wait to hear from y'all as far as your reaction to it. If it's anything like ours, this movie's going to be huge at the box office. And now it is time for Christian's favorite segment, Buy or Sell. <laughs> this is where Ashley's going to give us a premise, and then us boys at the table are going to say whether we buy it or sell it, then defend our choice. A first look at Kong Skull Island came during the MTV Movie Awards with a new behind-the-scenes video giving us a brief preview of the King Kong reboot. Kings of Summer Helmer Jordan Voight Roberts took on the blockbuster for the studio, enlisting an ensemble of A-list actors led by Brie Larson and Tom Hiddleston. Shedda Compton, Jason Mitchell, and Corey Hawkins also star with Samuel L. Jackson, John Goodman, Thomas Mann, Toby Kebbell, Tom Wilkinson, and John C. Riley. Kong Skull Island takes place in the 70s during the Vietnam era, with Hiddleston playing a former British SAS officer and Larson playing a photojournalist. The two lead a team to the undiscovered Skull Island, where they come face to face with none other than King Kong. Warner Brothers has already set plans in motion to cross this franchise with Gareth Edwards' Godzilla in an epic monster-on-monster -monster fight slated for release in 2020. But first, Kong Skull Island will open in theaters March 10, 2017. Christian a buy or sell the behind the scenes look at Kong Skull Island. Huge buy for me. I didn't know what to expect at all. I didn't know what era this took place. I didn't know where the mythology was going to be. It looks like they're totally revamping the King Kong mythology completely um, because they have to line up with Godzilla. So if this is taking place in the 70s during you know, it says Vietnam era, Vietnam uh, period, so they're doing that at that time, then we know that the New York thing doesn't, I don't think it's taking place in this timeline because eventually he's got to meet up with Godzilla. I'm okay with that. I'm cool with that. I've seen I've seen him fall off the Empire State Building three times. I don't need to see it ha happen It's again. emotional every it's time. It's emotional every know? time, but I don't I mean, let's see him now. If they're going to do this monster kind of shared universe thing, then give me an alternate timeline. You know, let's let's see where, where he survived and where they find him on Skull Island and he's doing different things and 
by the time he gets to 2000 and whatever, 15, 16, or whatever the hell that the Kong versus Godzilla, what's happened since then? A brand new King Kong movie that doesn't have to follow the constraints of the 19, was it 1932? 33. 33. Or what about yeah. Peter Jackson? King yeah, Kong, all that. Stuff. that stuff. Yeah, and, and because Jackson's was pretty much the homage to the 33 yeah. version, just with an extra hour and a half attached on a boat. to it. Like, yeah, huge on a boat. dinosaur um, fight yeah, in the middle of there. Dinosaur fight was amazing. <laughs> but so, yeah, man, I liked it. But what I really, what stuck out to me because we didn't see Kong obviously was the cast mm -hmm. what a cast I mean you're kidding me like this Oscar I mean the two guys that probably should have been nominated for Oscars or could have been nominated for Oscars Brie Larson Oscar won an winner. Oscar yeah, yeah uh, and then you got then you got Tom Hiddleston John Goodman who just kicked ass in uh, 10 Cloverville Lane so this is a great I, I loved it yeah and as you pointed out we have some members of NWA who are also going to be on the cast you got Corey Hawkins That's and Jason yeah, Mitchell yeah, yeah. yeah it's right. so exciting to see the cast this is a huge <clears throat> buy for me and if you guys are just going off the pictures treat yourself to actually check out the behind the scenes video that they aired which must have been the best part of the MTV movie awards was seeing that behind the scenes footage because it's Hiddleston and Brie Larson talking about how excited they are about making this movie the only part that gives me any doubt. I mean, you see the bones in there? Yeah. Look, look at what the bones. Yeah. The only thing that gives me a little bit of apprehension, and Christian, you just you, you kind of put a salve on it, is that I'm such a huge fan of the 33 version. I'll even watch the 76 version for the nice beards and Jessica Lang and the Peter Jackson vision because I love that story of them going to make a movie, this remote mm -hmm. island, and then he comes back to New York and wreaks havoc. So I hate that we have to retcon that, but it is the right decision. Yeah. It, you, nobody needs to go back and see that origin story again now we can take this great lush paradise that has some huge apes on there and we can turn that into some ape that's going to fight godzilla eventually you don't know what's going to happen to him now dude it's yeah. I, I i am so i was already so excited when they aired that like i think they just showed like a promo pic at comic-con a couple years ago and it just said hey we're making this movie called skull island i lost my freaking mm -hmm. mind after seeing this i'm even more excited yeah, I'm going to buy it, too. Uh, it sounds great. I mean, you know, they can't really show you anything. It's just people walking around with guns right now. So right. I was and bones. Bit, uh, and they bones. showed the dinosaur or the Kong bones. So, you know, maybe uh, we'll see Son of Kong, and that's who's going to fight Godzilla. It's, it's hard to tell what the movie's going to be, but what an awesome title, Skull Island, right off the bat. It's going to be exciting. You know, the, uh, you know, they might recreate that spider scene, but even more horrifying, like giant spiders. Who knows? Uh, it's exciting to me, so I'm going to buy it. You guys want to know something awesome? Yeah. We don't have to wait that long. In the, in the, in the, the way that movies work now, we don't have to wait that long. It's less than a year away. Really? So it's 2016, right? Yeah. yeah so 2017, nice. March 10th is when it comes out. That's so pretty soon. Get your popcorn ready. What's our next topic? The Russo brothers are on the press tour promoting their latest Captain America Civil War. And in speaking with the news outlets, the subject of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a hot topic naturally, with many wondering how Civil War sets up their next directing project, Avengers Infinity War. During a conversation with comicbook.com, directors Joe and Anthony Russo teased a lot of Marvel's players, with one being a particularly interesting one named Chris Pratt's Star-Lord. During the interview, they were asked what characters they're looking forward to working with and that they haven't with that they haven't already according to anthony russo the movies are intended to be a culmination of everything that's happened before in the mcu so you don't want to get into spoilers but i'm a big fan of what james gunn has done joe russo and i are both big fans of what james gunn has done star lord is a fantastic character and chris pratt is an awesome performer so you'd be very excited mark buy or sell these comments from the russos i will buy anything that the Russos want to sell me at this point because yes I have not seen the film yet but having those guys in studio here at the Collider offices yesterday they're just they're such passionate fans so when they talk about how Infinity War is going to be the culmination of everything in the MCU I believe them and I also believe that they're very intrigued with the prospect of incorporating all the outer space elements of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in an interview that's going to be airing on Thursday night on our Schmoes No Live show yeah. Christian you were asking them about you know what what it's like to be able to work in a bigger universe than just on Earth. And they seem like, and now obviously it's not going to play into Civil War, I don't think, but seeing that into Infinity War, it makes perfect sense to me. And if that is the case, Chris Pratt's going to be a huge part of that. Schnepp, do you buy this stuff as well? I do buy it. It's, you know, they didn't mention Star-Lord when they were hanging out with us, but, you know, thank God Star-Lord's Star going to be in it. 
Uh, one of the things they did say is, you know, um, Civil War is definitely like like a Winter Soldier. It's it's grounded. And with Infinity Wars, we're getting into the cosmic Marvel yeah. universe. We're getting into the bigger picture. So uh, Infinity Wars is so big, it's got to be two parts. Um, it's really exciting news. They're shooting the whole thing in IMAX. I mean, it just sounds fantastic. The whole thing? The entire film is being shot in IMAX. Wow. So it's going to be like one of the, obviously, the biggest films. It's never going to cut back and forth. Wow. It's just going to be all That's IMAX. That's awesome. Which is incredible. So, I mean, to have this giant cosmic odyssey happening with, you know, Star-Lord and all these other, like, super weird weird outer space Marvel characters mixed in with the Avengers, Thanos. It's a big picture. So I, I was expecting Star-Lord to be part of it, but it's great to hear that he is going to be. Christian, we got room for Chris Pratt on board Infinity War? I'm selling it. These guys are really horrible. Uh, they were <laughs> awesome. I'm buying it big. They were great, man. It was so fun to talk to both of them because they are passionate fans who know the comics who know where they want to go with this thing and we asked them a, a bunch of uh questions about furthering and what what characters that they can use and they're they said you know we're developing it and we may be able to use certain characters here and certain characters there and, and there's so much that they can do and they're also talked about how much they collaborate with other directors you know like they they're they're talking they talk to james gunn obviously they give me the guy who's directing spider-man they're um they're they collaborated with him they're collaborating with I mean, they, yeah yeah all with, I mean, with um, Doctor Strange, Derrickson, right? Yeah. Scott so, Derrickson. Scott yeah. Derrickson. So they're collaborating with all these guys because it furthers the story. They got to know what's happening. Um, so I, I, I think that Star Lord is definitely going to appear in the Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy. I hope he's in Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy. Too. You heard it here first. He's, he's going to be in, guys. Just breaking <laughs> scoop. Yeah. Uh, Star Lord. I know. He's going to be in what? Guardians of the Galaxy he's 2. He's going to be in the second one? I know. I know. But That's he's, insane. But he's also going to be in Infinity War. I think that it makes sense to put the Guardians of the Galaxy in that movie. And they even teased it on that Marvel event that we went to, what is it, a year and a half ago at, at El Capitan, when they showed this, this big teaser. The way that they cut it seemed like, oh, yeah, they're going to be in it, too. So I buy it. All right, well, our next story is about Star Wars. Will there be lightsabers in Episode Eight? Let's find out right now, Ashley. At the recent MTV Movie Awards, Star Wars The Force Awakens took home a number of awards, including one for Daisy Ridley's character, Rey. Afterwards, in an interview on the red carpet, MTV correspondent Josh Horowitz asked Daisy about her thoughts on the trailer for Rogue One, which quickly turned to the fans' theories of Felicity Jones' character being Rey's mother. Daisy debunked the theory immediately, saying that just because they look alike does not mean they are related. When the subject of Ray's parents came up, Daisy said that she does in fact know who Ray's parents are and that it doesn't matter, putting stress on the fact that her character is finding her place in episode 8, rather than searching through her past. Schnett by or sell Daisy Ridley's comments about Rogue One and Ray's parents. Totally by Ray Skywalker's uh, comments <laughs> on Rogue One. They're not related. Drop it. Leave it alone. Let it roll away. That's all I got to say. I just, I love, like, the word precocious gets overused sometimes when we're talking about people who are new to, it's never been used on me, but she is so good at handling the media because that from her first feature film, which was The Force Awakens, the first time we got to know her, so many questions coming at her about, like, oh, what's this, what's this, what's this? and she handles it all with grace. She's never let a spoiler slip, doesn't appear it's going to happen anytime soon, right. so I buy that she is aware of who her parents, in fact, are, but I also buy her take on it that it, that's not not the most important thing right now it's that this character ray is going to have some galaxies to save and that's what her focus is going to be but yeah we also really want to know what she knows christian yeah i mean i buy the comments because the thing is with her is you gotta remember she wasn't a big star wars fan before she started she was like everyone else was aware of it for sure and then she was thrust into the fandom and we know that the fandom is it can go fast and furious at you no matter what who are you what's what's your parents do you have a lightsaber can you use the force on me now like all that <laughs> stuff that they that she probably gets she did she is a pro at it already in this young career of hers she knows how to handle these questions i knew that the second you saw felicity jones another female in in a lead people are gonna go that's got to be ray's mom and i'm like so against it i hope i really hope that it's not and it was nice to hear her say whether or not she's pulling a it's not con um, then w that's possible as well, but I don't think it is. Yeah. I think that there's no way that they're going to do that. You really shrink the universe if you do it that way too. You don't need her to be Ray's mom. I would like. I almost wish that it, she that it turns into just something completely different. Is where you look at that. Did you guys talk about the last shot in Rogue One? Like, oh yeah, you did. You guys talked. So I mean, the fact that she might be 
either infiltrating. Oh, we didn't we didn't talk about the that we just you and me talked about. Oh, say, it no, on, no. say it online. So if you look at the Rogue One um, trailer at the very end, you see when uh, Forrest Whitaker is doing that voiceover that you see Felicity Jones in the in the black elite um, Vader squad mm -hmm. in the Tie Fighter the outfit. Tie Fighter and you outfit, hear that, man. <laughs> yeah, but now the question is, there's two. It's either is she infiltrating. Or does she become a member of, of the squad? Now I, I tend to think that it's gonna that she's infiltrating, but who knows what happens? We don't know that she's gonna live from that thing, and she's certainly not gonna meet Luke because Luke's you know d watching f farts or something. I don't know what he's doing. I don't, I don't think Luke is <laughs> watching <laughs> farts <laughs> on Tatooine. He's watching you know, Uncle Owen and Baru do God knows what. Staring at the ocean for a really yeah. long time. Give him a break. Yeah. The ocean. There's no ocean on Tatooine. Well, no. I mean, I'm talking about the. The new movies. <laughs> it's, an, it's an ocean of sand. It's an ocean of sand. You see, yeah. Rogue One takes place before A New Hope, which means that it's more likely, however right. unlikely, that Luke, it's more plausible that he is, in fact, watching farts <laughs> than he is staring at an ocean for everybody keeping score. He's thinking at home. of his future. He sees water. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that is all. Thank God. <laughs> for Hashtag fart watcher. <laughs> fart watcher. <laughs> fart watcher. <laughs> It's, it's not a bad name for him, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> Uncle Owen can rip some after a long day. It is now time for what's opening in theaters this weekend. Ashley, please rescue us from this segment. I'm going to try, I'm going to try. All right, coming out this week, The Jungle Book. Raised by a family of wolves since birth, Mowgli, Neil Sethi, must leave the, one, the only home he's ever known when the fearsome tiger Shere Khan, Idris Elba, unleashes his mighty roar. Guided by a no-nonsense panther, Ben Kingsley, and a free-spirited bear, Bill Murray, the young boy meets an array of jungle animals, including a slithery python and a smooth-talking ape. Along the way, Mowgli learns valuable life lessons as his epic journey of self-discovery leads to fun and adventure. A lot of farts in this movie, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All those different animals in the jungle. And it's look, a lot this of thing, our sophomore take on humor and comedy aside, this thing is the movie that you want to see and you want to take your entire family to see it. Like, it's that good. It has something for everybody in it. Like, Schnepp saw it last night. We were at the premiere last week. You really feel like you're in the jungle. You feel like it's you and a bunch of animals that are talking and they're talking to you. Every voiceover talent in this film is perfectly paired with their animal counterpart. And the kid, God love him. Look, look, the thing about the kid is like this kid had to act with literally nothing around him. Maybe there's a puppet, maybe there's a tennis ball. It's all downtown Los Angeles. Right. And the fact that he was even able to make it look like he might be Mowgli in this movie is such a credit to that kid's ability. Schnapp, you just saw the movie. You're sending people to see this weekend in a theater, right? Yeah, I think you, if you want, if you've seen the trailers, it lives up to the trailers. All the, the the character actors, the creatures, which are basically animals when you watch it, but you realize none of this is real, is a mind trip. Then you get used to it, and then you just are completely used to like little wolves talking. Mommy, is Mowgli coming back? It's like the animal acting in this. Hats off to all the effects teams who were able to create this incredible like jungle universe. And you're right, the kid who plays Mowgli. You know, he's a young kid. He's a brand new actor. I think he does a really good job. You know, basically, he was probably like, you're right, standing in a green screen with talking to a tennis ball. And he's able to, you know, pull off, for the most part, a really good role as Mowgli. I loved, like I said, all the acting. Christopher Walken kind of stole the movie for me uh, as, as King Louis. Wait till you see him. It's fantastic. Uh, if, you know, if you want to bring the whole family, it's really good. I would say if they're at five and under, I might keep them home because there are some scary moments. But overall, what a fantastic film. There's a lot of great action and it's really funny and as we go to Christian who is known on the panel for having the most refined palate when it comes to a sense of humor yeah. you're literally weeping the, the, the chat room is killing me right now the, uh, you guys that was some of the funniest stuff I'd ever seen on the chat room some of the stuff that they were saying was incredible good for you guys most of which we probably can't repeat no but right. it was really great stuff great plus stuff. when they cut this up into little sections people are going to be like what are you talking about I was, I was not you guys all got you me. AMC fans no the, the, the guys got like, me what's happening none um, of this is emotional no 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 no, 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 no. Right. Look, The Jungle Book is an amazing, amazing film. I loved the film. I gave it five out of five schmoes. Um, I thought it was just, it was emotional. Like I had mentioned earlier, I thought that what it did was that it, it really lent itself to what we loved about the animated film, but added new mythology. It, um, it The voice talent was off the charts. The, I really thought the kid was something special as well, because the fact that he had to just act against the green screen and you saw him when he just just the way he was kind of moating next to what we saw Baloo he saw nothing so and that that was that's hard for a lot of people
people to do. Just ask Natalie Portman and Hayden Christensen. So oh. Oh. it's hard to do. <laughs> um, so the fact that this kid did it, and I really, and I was on board from start to finish. It is a good movie. I, I wouldn't take kids younger than around six to see the movie. I think that there's a lot of kind of like Shere Khan by Idris Elba is a terrifying villain. One of the I most said five. You had up, up it to six. I'd say six. I, I'm like, my, 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 yeah, my daughter's about four and a half and she's she's not ready for it right. yet. Um, but I think that, it, yeah, around like six and maybe even seven. I don't know. It just depends on your kid, I guess. But this movie is, is really, Favreau knocks it out of the park. I can say that if you're in your 30s, you should definitely see this movie. Uh -huh. And uh, when you were talking, I just glanced in the chat real quick. It's hysterical. It's great. You guys are hilarious. Thank you so much for contributing. Oh you want to call it that? It's to making Christian weep. Now it is time for mailbag. This is one of our favorite parts of the show because we get to hear from you guys. You guys have been emailing us constantly. And if you want to get in on that, just send us an email. <laughs> Collidervideo at gmail.com is how you reach us. We always pick out a few mailbags to talk about. And at the end of the show, we're going to reserve some time for your live Twitter questions. If you want to tweet Ashley right now, do so at Collider Video and try to keep it mature. But I know that's probably not going to happen. Ashley, what's our first mailbag? Isaiah Belcher writes hey collider what Perfect. would you say are some of the most underrated comedies of the past decade i would go with i love you man with paul rudd and jason siegel isaiah i'm right there with you on i love you man i think it's a fantastic movie as was role models that also had paul rudd in it. and i don't think really got the recognition that deserves him and sean william scott are hysterical in that movie before i give the rest of my picks i will defer to the panel schnepp mm. your favorite underrated comedy recently recently uh, recently, it would be Seven Psychopaths. I thought that was awesome. Speaking of Christopher Walken, Colin Farrell, Woody Harrelson, it's got an all star cast. Sam it's Rockwell. Sam yeah. Rockwell, not leaving him out. He, everybody in it's great. Totally underrated. I, don't, I think seven people saw it. And it's like, check out Seven Psychopaths. Going a, a little bit uh, back a little bit ways, I might say Kingpin. Also, Woody Harrelson, uh, one of the Quaid brothers, Randy Quaid. <laughs> um, incredible. Incredible Fairly Brothers, uh, freaking amazing Bill Murray standout performance. If you've never seen Kingpin, check it out. Oh, Big Earn McCracken, one of the great characters of the 90s. Christian, how about you? <laughs> I'm going to go with two, with two of them. I'll go with one most recent was Bad Words. Uh, mm. Jason Bateman's first directed Ooh, film. Good one. Um, I, I got... Uh, man, I got some hard laughs out of that one. I thought he did a really great job. Um, just his sense of humor is my sense of humor. And there's certain things that he says, I just can't believe that the character says it. And when he does, there's, there's few people that can get away with saying it and not sound like so like, oh, that's horrible that he said that. But it's so funny the way that he, he that he does. Um, and I think that if you want to go back even more 20 some odd years, I'd go mall rats. Um, which I know a lot of people like, but it's not as it's not as talked about as it should be. It's, mm -hmm. I think it's one of Kevin Smith's best. So Definitely. those are the two that. Yeah, it's I always say. it's always kind of like the uh, like like the black sheep of the family. If you're looking at like Clerks, you, then Mallrats, and then Chasing Amy was really good too. So right. yeah, Mallrats is great. I'm gonna throw one at you. I don't know if it counts. You guys think that uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall is good enough to be, or, or it can, can be considered underrated? I think it was a big hit. It was a pretty big hit, right? It should be rated. I mean, if it's yeah. underrated, it should be then, not underrated. Then I'll throw these series of movies at you, which not everybody likes, and I can't say that they're good, but they make me giggle hysterically, are the Johnny English movies with Rowan Atkinson mm -hmm. as like a bumbling oh, okay. secret agent. It's the closest thing we get to the classic spoof movies like Airplane, Top Secret, and Naked Gun. See, Check out Johnny English. They're, I like I like Mr. Bean more than I, I I'm not gonna fight you on it. Johnny oh no no English, no, no. Mr. Bean say, and Black Adder are like yeah, all time classics. Yeah. Johnny English it, it's it's pretty. If you funny, like right? Rowan Atkinson, it's really I, I stupid too. Yeah. Okay. What's our next mailbagger? D. Ericius Dawson writes, "Hey Collider, I have a quick question. If The Simpsons made a movie with real actors, who do you think would be a good Homer Simpson?" P.S. I think Schnepp will be a great comic book guy in the movie. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my God! I think you should that all go home amazing. and re repoly bag your comics. Oh, <laughs> that so is good. amazing. Yeah. It would be great. <laughs> Everybody, this is why The Simpsons is such a genius show. Maybe the greatest show of all time, and I'm including you. Sports Center. It's because everybody knows somebody like so many of those characters, like Mo Sislak, the bartender, or the the comic book guy. Everybody knows somebody like that. You know, like my favorite line from the comic book guy is when he says, "That's an autographed picture of Sean Connery, autographed by."
by Roger Moore. Like, <laughs> he's just such a great nerd know-it-all, yeah, and he's just so mean to customers. It's per Not that you're mean to people. I wish I could be as mean as the comic yeah. book. Mark Ellis, you didn't see Captain America Civil War. <laughs> Me and Christian did. That makes us somewhat better than you right now. <laughs> okay, so you I go to the mill house to my Bart. Christian, what do you think? Who should be playing Homer Simpson? And if we were in a Simpsons movie, who do you think we'd play? Well, I'd, I would take Brian Baumgartner as Homer from uh, Kevin from The Office. Mm. You're, you're, do you remember who we're talking about? That's uh, totally, totally good. Yeah. How yeah. great is that guy? I mean, he that guy would be great as Homer Simpson. Um, who would we play? Yeah. Really? Who do you think we could pull? Uh, Hi, Homer! Ah! <laughs> I'd probably do Barney. <laughs> That's not a bad Barney. Pretty good. Man. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I, uh, Homer. Yeah, I always grew up wanting to be like Bart, but I think my favorite character on the show is the guy who's no longer with us. And it's not because he passed away that The Simpsons went downhill, but I really oh, miss on. both Troy McClure and Lionel Hutz, the slimy attorney. Those were two of my favorites of all time. You know what I was going to say should be Homer Simpson, but he's got to grow into the role, oh. is J.J. Abrams' boy, Greg Grunberg. He's really mm. funny. He calls into morning radio a lot. He's got a mm. great sense of humor. He's a good actor. He was in a bit part in The Force Awakens, but as he matures, and then maybe we can like shave his gorgeous had a hair, he could play a good Homer Simpson. I'm telling you right now. I got a weird one. Jason Sudeikis. Like, As Homer? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think mean, Sudeikis just, could pull that off. Yeah, I mean, give him a bald, you know, baldy cap, but mm -hmm. everyone has to have that strange, you know, like, yellow ochre, pale yellow, you know, complexion. You know what I mean? To make it, like, extra weird. I don't know if they would do that. But. What do you think about that, Barney? I would like to see <laughs> JTE. <laughs> It's, it's Mr. Burns. It's like you killed me on it. I, I think it. you should all be polybagged and put into a white box and in, put it inside of my closet. Sorry about that. <laughs> Ashley, who's your favorite Simpsons character? Uh, Nelson. I mean, not my favorite character, but I think if I, you know, if I could be a Simpsons character, I'd be Nelson. <laughs> he just like makes yeah. fun of people all day. I, I, it's so I great. taught my daughter to do that. Like if someone says something ridiculous, she looks like. <laughs> <laughs> nice. One of the great bully characters in history. Let's go to the mall and steal some baked potatoes. Okay, Ashley, what are the Twitter questions have for us today? Traverage writes, what is the worst movie going experience you've had and why? Oh, man. Well, I, I got to get the one that always sticks in my head and sticks in my crawl is Christian and I, uh, before we were certified by everybody under the sun, we occasionally would pay to see one movie, then we'd sneak into another movie. So we paid to see Prince of Persia, which I thought was actually a pleasant surprise. I thought Joan Hall was great. Then we went from that into another movie featuring a lot of sand, Sex in the City oh 2. God. And uh, I had to escape, guys. I actually escaped about an hour into the movie. And you should never text in a movie theater, but we were sitting in the balcony. Nobody else could see it. So I escaped to go to the bathroom. And then I just kind of stand in the lobby and try to collect myself for 10 minutes. He realizes what's going on. And then he, too, escapes. No, from but that I looked at my phone because I'm like, wait a minute, this guy's gone. I'm like, he didn't eat anything that he'd be gone for like an hour. I'm like, he's gone. And I looked at my phone and it just goes, get out of there. Get out of there now. And then I just dipped. It was horrible. It was, but I, that's not that's not the one. Um, I will blame you for something that is my worst of all time. Um what is that? Three Days to Kill is a movie that was with uh, Kevin Costner. You know exactly where I'm going with this. Uh, so there, I was. We were at this theater that the, doesn't no longer has this, these seats, but these really comfy kind of seats at this screening room. And I sat there, and he was there. And out of nowhere, he decides he does this weirdo thing sometimes, where he just like gets up in the middle of. He's like, oh, I'm a flight risk. I got to go to the front. I call myself it. a flight risk because sometimes I want to go sit right in the front row because I don't like seeing heads. But he didn't in front say of me. anything, and it was too early for him to do this, so he leaves. leaves Leaving that seat open. Right. So a guy who looks like uh, it was like Jeff Dunham's one of his puppets sits, oh my sits down and the guy and, and I was like, OK, and I don't know this person. And during the whole movie, the guy's like, huh? <laughs> huh? Like, what? He would laugh what at something. You? He would laugh and grab me like, how about that? That was interesting. Huh? Oh, you didn't see that one coming, did you? And he like oh, would shake me throughout the whole God. thing. And then he's oh like, my God. And, and then he, he turned and he turned and be like, Kevin Costner, he's not really much of a movie star now anymore, is he? But he had his day. And I'm like, get off of me. <laughs> and like, I couldn't say anything to the guy because he's an old man. I don't want to bother. But uh, I was just, how I, old was he? Oh, he must have been like I, I, I put 65. him mid 60s, oh, 70. Wow. Yeah. Right. That, that makes I'm not going to say different. anything yeah. to the guy, but it was like, but he was assaulting me throughout oh, the, the movie. To so this day, we've we, we seen him in a lot of screenings. <laughs> to this day, we refer to him simply as the nudger. 
<laughs> yeah, wow. yeah. Can you can you even approach a movie theater experience that ridiculous? Yeah. No, not really. I mean, I guess the the closest I can is like as I was seeing Tron Legacy with Holly and some guy in a jingle jangle kind of Michael Jackson jacket <laughs> got on his cell phone and was literally like walking around the theater. No, no, listen, hold it. Like walking <laughs> oh, around the God. theater while the movie was playing. I just instantly went and got one of the ushers I was like, yo, um, that dude, <laughs> get rid of him. Couldn't find him when we came back in. Him and his girlfriend, because they, they, I had told them to shut up and he wouldn't listen to me. So mm. like, they, had, they were hiding up in the, up in the very top. Like, and it was like, so I don't see who you're talking about, sir. I was like, looking around and some other people in the audience were like, he's up there. I was like, thank you. There he is. So I pointed him out. <laughs> he's trying to slink down. And the usher was like, well, I can't do anything if I don't see him talking. I said, I'm telling you he was talking. Yeah. How about that? And so I left, went and got the manager. So what ended up happening is I like, ruined the rest of Tron for me. It was like, it was like oh, literally man. like 30 minutes left in Tron. I didn't, didn't see the rest of it. And uh, this idiot... <laughs> Um, basically, the ushers surrounded me because they thought I was going to attack this guy because I was waiting oh, wow, at, the, okay. at the exit. I was like, come on, buddy. Like after the movie was over, I was like, come on, man. You got to walk past me. What's up? You know, <laughs> taco, taco. Let's talk, man. Taco. And so, so all the ushers surrounded me like I was the risk. And I was like, why didn't you kick this guy out? They're like, sir. So anyway, it, nothing really happened except I got to say some words to the guy in, in his face, which was great. Um, and then we were walked out separately, but with cops. Well, to be fair, though, to be fair, <laughs> ruin the movie. I'm sure that I was also the cause of somebody's worst experience as well, too, because I went and my wife and I saw Bruno like mm. when it came out and it was a packed theater. Right. And right. I got I had gotten all these treats and I had on, I, I forget it was like a so no, no, we had a sparkling water that she brought from. Oh, home fancy. It. And <laughs> it was a sparkling water because and I so I had it and I was like, <laughs> poor bastard. I was wrestling with it and I finally. I open the thing up and it just explodes and it yes. hits this dude right in the face. It's amazing. And the guy goes like this, oh, 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 like that. And I and I was like, oh my god, I was, I was, I was, I, like it. It hit him like a, like it, it it was like a fight like first blood when Rambo got yep. hit in the in the cell. Yep. It was like that. Oh, and dude. and I just and I was like, I'm sorry, man. And the guy just sat there like this watching the movie. Oh, and I felt, it was horrible. I mean, I felt horrendous, but it, it wasn't done on purpose. Let me the tell you, you just, so you just reminded me of one of the worst things that happened that I did to an entire audience. I had a giant one of those like super like gallon yeah. jugs of iced tea and a thing of nachos. And I was walking up all these stairs. Uh -oh. And the entire, I was like, I got to the theater late. I swear to God, it was one of these. I think I can't remember. It was 2008. I swear to God, it was like a Kevin Smith film, whichever film. That some a comedy or something that came out in 2008 because I left the theater after this happened. It was so embarrassing. I was walking up and I was like, I got in the theater late and the lights were still on, but there was no seats except for the very top upper like right hand corner. I was like, God damn it! So walking with this giant unwieldy jug of stuff and I had a backpack and it's like it's New York so you have coats and all this mad shit and I'm like walking and I literally I got to my my chair and turned and then tripped. Oh and no. Flipped. The nachos and the, the ice giant jug iced tea went up in the air and jacked three rows of people. What if it was the same guy that got hit with the sparkling water? <laughs> but that horrible. Life. I had to leave the theater. I had to actually leave. Um, I, I would have. I would have left. I just walked into another movie and sat there. Uh, I don't even remember what movie I saw because I was like, I was like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was yelling. I'm sorry. People thought I was like some kind of a risk, definitely of some kind because of, oh, people dude. were covered in iced tea. There's nothing you could do. That's like. There's nothing I. Could Oh, you had to describe the origin story for the supervillain known as the Nudger. Like, he's a guy who <laughs> nudges <laughs> other people because he got nachos thrown on him. Ashley, yeah. before we get off this topic, oh which this gosh. has been a great Twitter question, have you ever Amazing. had, like, a horrific movie theater experience? No, I really, I really haven't, which makes me think that I'm the guy with the Michael Jackson outfit. I'm the guy on the phone. I really, I haven't had one. That's Thank the thing. Nice. If you've never had a bad movie theater experience, then you the are the one annoying it. everybody yeah. else. It's so fine. Or take you're just it into consideration. Good, good patron, that's all. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I, I have a lot of patience, so that's that's probably why. Ooh, that was a hell of a tweet. That was right. amazing. All right. We can follow that. Hopefully we can have some more jokes with this one. Rob Cartel writes, in honor of Christian, which movie has the best fart joke moment? Mm. Damn. Blazing there's... Saddles. Ooh, Blazing right. Saddles is a yeah. great yeah. fart joke. I, I would, I'm tempted to say Dumb and Dumber, but it turns into something else pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but that scene is amazing. Like that was, My girlfriend and I were talking about that because that's how you get romantic. Huh? Is That scene in Dumb and Dumber, it's Where like... Where Daniels the, is on the toilet? That was the first, yeah. yeah, that was the first time that you really got to see like a poop joke taken yeah. to that yes. level. And the fact that it worked. 
yeah. is incredible. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen to this day. Uh, the Caddyshack, which I know you love so much, uh, uh, when uh, Rodney Dangerfield, uh, somebody step on a duck? I don't know if old men used to be able to do that and celebrate it, yeah, but he's so in the middle of a face. dance. Or yeah. he's no, just, he's at dinner. He was, he's, at, he was at the table. He's, when he's at the table, he's, it's just that face. He's just like... <laughs> And he just looks uh, up. It's, it's so great. Now I know why tigers <laughs> yeah. eat their young. Good, yeah. uh, good fart humor in uh, in your history. I'm going to agree with all you guys. Nice. <laughs> it's, it's, oh we've had, we spent enough time on farts. Yeah, yeah, all fun. right. Next question. Vex Fletcher writes, "What movie could best describe your childhood?" Ooh, that oh, is man. a tough one. So everything that happened in our childhood. You know what? You know what really uh, blows for me is that. It's a movie that makes me cry at the end of it for very different reasons, is that my entire life and the story of the Ellis family is pretty much Marley and me. Mm. Like, you, you got a dad who's got a job, he's got to move around a lot, and but you have this dog that's just with you every step of the way. I was an Air Force brat, so you move all over the country all the time. We had Augie, the best German Shepherd you'll ever meet. She was with there every cross-country trip we made. It was three kids, two parents, and the dog there. We had some cats that I fell in love with, but like Augie was just always there for us. I miss that dog to this day. She was the greatest pup on earth. You really just brought the mood down. Yeah, I know. You well, really my, just mine's mine's boring because it's like every everybody has this as a kid. Cape Fear. Oh. <laughs> No, no, not, not it. I was gonna, no. Which De Niro is the nudger? Oh, uh, Robert Duvall in The Great Santini. My dad, you know, wants to love him for a little bit, but he's like one of those guys. When I was like in a in playing basketball, he'd be there. Like, Come on, let's go, let's go. Like that over excited dad. Right. Um. But that, you know, just a moment of that maybe, and probably some like early Woody Allen moment movies. You know, would be my family. Yeah, those are good. Also, Teen Wolf. Uh, until he turns into the werewolf. Everything else yeah. about that was me on a basketball <laughs> back, back court. Back to the Future, though, is the one that I will say. Oh, yeah. God. Just, just lies. Don't listen to him. Okay, uh -huh. Ashley. Next question. All right. King Joker writes: Actors or directors that stood the test of time. Uh, there's a few of them. Actors and directors. Uwe Boll. Uh, no, uh, well, Spielberg. Obviously. Yeah, Spielberg, Scorsese, Kubrick, uh, David Lynch, David, uh, David Cronenberg. Um, yeah, Daniel I mean, Day-Lewis, as far as actors go. Yeah, you can, you can go really oh, far actors back. Actors Marlon sure. Brando. If you look at things that really stood the test of time, I think part of what that it requires is for everybody to emulate you and to be inspired by mm -hmm. you. So if you look at a guy like John Ford making westerns or Kurosawa, like it'll pretty much, so many action movies and space fantasies and stuff come from those simple tellings of stories that were in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And so. everyone's influenced by other people. So it's like you could pick people like John Carpenter, who did a, had a great run in the 70s and 80s. 80s, but he was influenced by like you know Howard Hawks. I mean, there's so many. Everyone's influenced by other people. So if you want to check out Orson Welles, a lot of his movies stand the test of time. Check out Charlie Chaplin's uh, later films like Limelight. That's an incredible film. Yeah, check uh, out Sergio uh, Leone. Check out Paul Newman in The Hustler because you think like, like you know sometimes comedies, especially again the 50s and 60s, don't always t stand the test of time. Go see The Hustler. That 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 movie could have come out today, and it's like the same level of enjoyment and drama. Him going up against this this legendary pool player. It's a great Great, great movie, and it still holds up to this day. Werner Herzog's films are amazing. Fitzcarraldo, definitely check that out. Aguirre, Wrath of God. He's got these really weird meditational films. You're turning about. into the comic book guy from the Simpsons. Yeah. Uh -huh. My Actually. encyclopedic knowledge of these films is affecting all of us. <laughs> uh, what's our next question, Ashley? Isaiah Gonzalez writes, do you think the boss can hold the number one spot for the weekend? The boss, the movie, yeah. Well, the shit rats don't think so, and I don't either, simply because there's a lot of rats, there's a lot of bears, snakes, lions, tigers. The Jungle Book comes out this weekend, and it's going to crush the boss, and rightfully so. I think the Jungle Book's going to be on top. I think the Jungle Book has a good chance of being number one after the Huntsman Winter's War mm. comes out. That could be one of those movies that was very expensive to make, and there just isn't a huge market for it. The Jungle Book, there's a large market for that movie. I think it's going to crush the boss. You guys disagree? No, Jungle Book's going to be up there until uh, Cap and Iron Man hit the scene. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I would like to see Melissa McCarthy like wrapped around that snake. That would be a really cool image, being like slowly squeezed. <laughs> Your box office is over, you know. <laughs> and our graphics man Ray has his homework for the yeah. weekend. Let's do two more Twitter questions, Ash. Okay, Mr. Willems writes: Will VHSs ever make a comeback like vinyl records? No, absolutely not. No. There's well, Deadpool has a VHS. It's a limited edition, and you have to spend like fifty bucks if you want to spend an incredible amount of money and be like one of those like guys with a like twirly, uh, you know, hipster mustaches. Like, hey, collect only VHS. You know, <laughs> yeah. you could rock that, but it's not gonna have a. Comeback. No, the difference is that records are 
kind of cool. Yeah. Like when you have a record player, like old school record player, the sound of it, just the in general, like they even look kind of cool. Like VHS is a mess. Yeah. It's like the with the, the, the rewinding tape and, the, and tape and it's pass. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like, like, but yeah, you're right. Like vinyl records, like they actually have a different sound, and it's like a warm tone you get. You get the snaps and the pops and stuff, and then even like cassettes. Cassettes have a cool sound to them that you can kind of rock out to in a way that you can't really recapture digitally. But as far as movies go, the video audio presentation, they still sell VHS tapes at places. I think Amoeba probably has some, but mm -hmm. I think you want to stick with with digital, yeah. or at least a Blu-ray for that. Okay, last Twitter question of the day. All right, Robert D. Herrera writes, any news on the new Halloween or Friday the 13th movies? I go right to our man Schnepp. What's the latest? Well, Friday the 13th, supposedly now it's not a uh, you know found footage film. They've Good. like scrapped that, but they are going back to 1981. So it's gonna be a period piece, Friday the 13th set in the past, which I think is a great idea. I just want them to make it sometime before I die. It would that's be great like, to cool. see them go back they, to that, 81. That's what they're doing. Yeah. So that they're going to Camp Crystal Lake doing a, a you know, an older, you know, a, a flashback movie. So it'll be cool. That's right. The invasion tour was happening, but look out kids, you're probably not making out of that camp alive. Uh Christian, do you have any desire to see another retelling of Friday the 13th or Halloween? No. <laughs> Say, Come on! I don't, I don't disagree with your sentiment, but I love horror movies, and I'd love to see those yeah. movies done right once again for a new generation. Because then, eventually, we can have Freddie and Michael Myers go up against Jason. Then we also need another Freddie. We'll get it all figured out here. That is the end of our show. What an amazing train wreck of a program we had, <laughs> featured with farts, animals, and of course, nudging. My name is Mark. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I want to thank everybody behind the scenes putting up with us, as well as all of you tolerating our silliness. And the gentleman here at the table, Mr. John Schnepp, where can the kids find you? Yes, you can follow me at Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. Check out my Kickstarter, Sweaties Unite Rise of the Uber Nerd. It's the last week. Donate, help me make the film. All right, I'm tweeting it right after the show. I promise it's really happening today. Christian, how about you? Okay, for me, make sure you go to at Christian Harloff Twitter and Instagram. And what I would love for you guys to do, if possible, go to the Schmo's Twitter. Right now, I've got a poll up there that is going to be for the Schmo Down next week. Who's going to win between John Schnepp? and Finstock. Go and vote on that. And also, if you want to go to my personal one, we have one as far as you have Josh McCuga and Clark Wolf going down. That's going down on Friday. I got a question for you, Schnepp. Who yeah. do you think is going to win between Clark Wolf and Josh McCuga? Josh McCuga is number two contender. If he wins, right. he plays the winner of uh, Riley and JT for the title. That's a, that's a rough one, man. I mean, Clark is really smart. And Makuga's kind of smart, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, yeah. he went, but he gets lucky. He, he through that tournament. He, no, he I mean, it was like, him well, and Riley. A, the only way Finstock is going to beat me is with oh, luck. Right. So, I mean, that's. I mean, that's. Uh, the, like, we're not even going to talk about Finstock and his weird mask. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. whatever. Well, that's um, next week. We'll talk. Yeah, about that's next week. Uh, the only way Makuga can possibly win is with luck. I mean, it's like. He thought Andrew Garfield was still Spider-Man. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, Cougar, come on, man. You got to get with it. Who do you, who do you got? Who do you got? Look, I, I, I think I think Schnapp wins in a walk, but I also think that Makuga is... It, I just I can't believe that we live in a world where we could have Makuga versus JTE for, for a title. championship belt. I know. That sounds all wrong, and somebody's going to have to intervene if that is a potentiality. Yeah. For me, I got Makuga by that much, but I have Schnapp being the first knockout of the new league, knocking out Finstock pretty easy. Won't even what, get to round three. How about do you, you Ash? What do I think what? And that's the show for today. <laughs> so, Thank you guys so much. If, if, you guys, Bye, guys. If, if you guys want to watch any of these Schmodown matchups, there's a playlist <laughs> that's put together. Thank you. I can't I mean, I'm super excited with the amount. I mean, we, John Campus matches over 130,000 views nice. right now, and uh, Manson Roca's 115. So you guys have been watching and liking it. Thank you so much. Please continue to do it because we have a lot of cool ones coming up. And now we turn it over to Ashley to do what she does best. Tell us where we can find her on Twitter. Guys, Fart Watchers. You guys can find me watching Farts on Twitter <laughs> and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. Make sure you guys go to amctheaters.com. That's where you hit to get all the latest box office showtime information. And check out collider.com. That's where we get a lot of our news stories that we talk about with you guys. Bookmark that page. And while you're on the interwebs, make sure you guys subscribe to the Collider Video YouTube channel. And then for all your movie reviews and other fun stuff, come over to Christian and I's channel, Schmoes No. My name is Mark. You can find me at Mark Ellis Live. And I'll be at the Comedy Store on Sunset in West Hollywood this week weekend see you guys soon <laughs> hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider <laughs>